Well, hello, you bunch of primitive sluts. I'm Vince, also known as Pleasant Kenobi on the internet, and today we're playing Blue White Death and Taxes again. Now, I looked at when I last played this for like one of the Mimi gameplay videos, and that was on February 1st, and I'm recording this on January 30th. So actually, it was exactly a year ago that I played any Blue White Taxes, Spooky Hate Bears, or whatever the fuck you want to call it. This is DNT, this is Death and Taxes. It's playing Aether Vile, it's playing Flicker Wisp, it's playing Leonardo, it's playing Stalia. If you're not familiar with how these cards interact with each other, I'll go very, very quickly into that and then talk about what the blue version is doing. So, our game plan is to fuck with our opponent's mana. Thalia makes spells cost more, and Arbiter makes searching your library difficult, which is good against certain decks like Escape Shift and Storm with gifts, but it's mainly good against fetch lands. Then, in addition to our beloved... Okay, fun fact. I'm filming this intro after I've played some games with it. Uh, so I've played a league with this now. And I played with only two Ghost Quarters because I basically fumbled the numbers when writing into Goldfish. This should be four Ghost Quarters. Hence why I had so much room for planes. I was like, what? what am I missing? I'm a fucking idiot. We should be playing four Ghost Quarters. I recommend you all play four Ghost Quarters. For some reason, I didn't in the video um, because I'm just a fucking idiot. But when Leon Arbiter doesn't play and your opponent's tapped out, this is just a strip mine. It blows up a land, even a basic land, and they can't go searching. It's really fucking good. So we're going to fuck around with our opponent's game plan, apply pressure. The way we apply pressure is three ones in the air, three fours in the air, or we play a one one that creates a three three at first strike that whenever it's flickered by, let's say a flicker whisper or restoration angel, it makes another three three. And then you just get a really wide board and fuck your opponent up. Our removal is part of exile. Our land disruption is normally four ghost quarters and two field of ruin, but I really fucked that up. That's hilarious. I cannot fucking believe I did that. That probably would have made some of our games go a little bit better. Hmm, interesting. Uh, we've got two copies of Giver Room because the card's pretty good. Uh, Blade Splice is an absolute fucking babe of mine. I love that card. Uh, two Charming Prints to give more flicker effects because flickering is the name of the game when it comes to DNT. Disruption plus flickering and a bit of White Weenie equals DNT. And then, well, we've got a Stoneforge package because, well, we can we can flicker our Stoneforge to get two, two equipment. But the reason we're playing blue is quite literally for Soul Herder. I haven't played it in DNT yet. It's a three mana one one that at the end of your turn you can exile a creature you control and bring it back to play immediately. And it grows whenever a creature is exiled on the battlefield. That's yours or theirs. So if you path their creature, it grows. If you detention sphere their multiple creatures, it grows multiple times. If you charming prince, flicker wisp, restoration angel, or soul herd of your own creature, it grows. This card gets quite big quite quickly and also has incremental value as time goes on. Flicker a Blade Splicer, get a 3-3. Three, three. Flicker a Charming Prince, gain life or scry 2. Flicker an Arbiter to reset it after attacking. Flicker a Stone Force to get the second piece of equipment. And so on and so on. You can even flicker a Restoration Angel which comes back immediately. Restoration Angel then flickers a Flicker Wisp and suddenly your entire board is untapped. Seems pretty good. In the sideboard, I have some blue cards. So we've got some pretty standard stuff that I normally play in DNT. We've got, I'll show you those very quickly, a Damping Sphere or two to help against Amulet and Storm and Tron. Some of those matchups are relatively good for us anyway, but the fact that this covers so many bases means that I don't leave the home without two of them because it just helps against so many decks. And I like sideboard slots that are versatile and help against multiple decks. On that case, we've got Western Peace. Uh, it helps really well. Two copies against any graveyard deck. And there are still some. Some people are still playing Dredge. Some people are playing uh, Crab Vine. Other people are playing um, uh, Escape from the Underworld. Emery decks. All that kind of shit. Uh, one off's pretty good to bring against Jund to shrink their coifs and stop the K cards from being so good. It's just a good card, right? Winds of Abandon. Uh, an extra removal spell. It's also good to have at least one extra removal spell on your sideboard. It varies what you need to pick. I'm picking Winds of Abandon because it's a mass overloaded wrath. Avon Rift Watcher is a flying thing that eventually dies, but it gains life when it enters and leaves. So if you flicker it every turn, you're getting full life. It seems good. Kitchen Fix is pretty good, not only as a life gain creature, but it also crosses over as being a grindy card because it's two bodies. If a Jund player kills us with a bolt or a push, it comes back. And then you can reset it with your Soul Loader. So Kitchen Fix is a grindier health gain card. Avon Rift Watcher is a flying and attacking and blocking life gain card. So they serve slightly different purposes and cross over into different decks. Revoka is a better version of P Pithing Needle, also for Spyglass, because we can reset it with our Soul Hooders and Flicker Wisps. Gideon, Ally of Zendikar, we bring in when we cut off Thalys against mid-range decks. And Idol of Rhetoric is good against Storm and decks that want to cast multiple spells a turn, obviously. Then we have Lavinia. I don't even know what it actually really does. It's good against Terminus. It's good against... Uh... Mishra's Bauble or other free spells in the Emery Urza decks, I guess. It might end up never coming in. And then we have a Deputy of Detention, which is a quite a good overing effect on a body that we can reset later on the line. We, we might exile something early on, then we want to exile something better later on the line. It is fragile being a 1-3 dice to bolt, but 
You also get to grow your soul herder multiple times if you hit more than one creature with it. It's pretty good at dealing with like lots of Field of the Dead tokens. It's pretty good at uh, exiling uh, multiple blood ghasts and things like that. And then Reflect Mage, we don't have in the main deck. We have it in the side for when we play against a creature deck because Modern has got a lot of combo decks where Reflect Mage is quite bad. I don't even think it's that good against Tron necessarily unless they're strictly Eldrazi Tron. We're going to bring it in and hopefully get double triggers off of it by bouncing it when you play it and bouncing it at the end of turn with a soul herder and fucking love life. The tempo gain off Reflect Mage is huge because they can't replay the card afterwards for, the, for a whole turn, but if you're bouncing something every turn thanks to Soul Herder, it's quite a good temple advantage that other creature decks will find it hard to compete with. And that's the fucking deck, my friends. I hope you enjoy the video. If you like it, leave a like down below. Drop me a comment with what you think of the deck list. Don't forget this video is brought to you by the love and attention and compassion of my Patreons over on Patreon.com. Please go check that out. If you give money to me, you can be part of my Discord server, get onto my Minecraft server, play League of Legends with me, get involved in conversations, and it also means I don't have to make Raid Shadow Legends sponsored fucking sections to my videos. And also, don't forget, we are sponsored by ChannelFireball.com. A sponsor that lets me do pretty much what I want as long as I'm not being an asshole. So, big shout out to Channel Fireball for sponsoring this. They have a great website full of singles and sealed product. If you're signing up for a GP, a Magic Fest as they call it, or buying anything from channelfireball.com, use the discount code Kenobi. You get discount on sealed product. You get uh, no discount on Magic Fest, but it helps to support the channel directly. And with that out of the way, let's play some modern. We have one the dive roll. Tiny, tiny hands. I okay, should make that bigger. Here we go. We've got soul herders. We've got flicker wisps. It's a slow hand, but I'm tempted to keep it simply because, well, it's got new cards in it. <laughs> I kind of just want to keep it because it's got soul herder. Probably not the correct thing to do. Our opponent leads foothills, cracking it. Stomping grounds, shocking themselves. Goblin guide. This appears to be some form of zoo or burn. Our hand's a little slow. I really want to draw a stoneforge mystic here, I think. To give us a turn two play that allows us to find a battle skull. <laughs> Ask and ye shall receive. Now, of course, there's always a small chance that they go ahead and bolt this, but that's one less bolt going to our face. Also get the battle skull out of our deck, doing a little bit of thinning. The problem being as well, though, that with two equipment in hand, soul herding our Stoneforge Mystics is actually minimal value. They fetch and shock themselves into a sacred foundry, and they searing blaze our mystic. We go to 15. Get attacked with the Goblin Guide. Finds us a Restoration Angel on top of our library. We go to 13. Draw the Resto. I'm going to play a Wisp here that I think I'm going to trade in for the Goblin Guide. That said, if we get a Soul Herder online and Flicker the Flicker Wisp, we get to set the Goblin Guide out for a turn, which seems pretty strong. Monetary Swift Spear from our opponent. Lightning Bolt from our opponent. Take four from our opponent, revealing Arbiter on top of our library. We need to draw one of one of our lands so we can go Resto into Battle Skull, and it looks like we're not going to manage that. We cast in an Arbiter. They crack their fetch land in response. They've seen this card before. They don't shock themselves, they don't have any one mana removal in hand. I'm going to trade this in for the Goblin Guide at first opportunity, and then hopefully hit a land for our Resto, then hit a land for our Battle Scar. Second Swift Spear. Goblin Guide reveals a Soul Herder on top of our life. We're going to draw all three of our fucking Soul Herders. I'm going to go for the block that leaves us with a body. If they have a spell, this is a blowout, but I mean, we're so far behind, we have to hope for, hope for good luck. It's a Targus Command. We take three and we die. Okay, it's round two. Okay, it's game two. We have Arbiter plus a Rift Watcher. So we're going to keep this. We're going to leave the Hallow Fountain tapped for hills from our opponent. They shock themselves. They play a Goblin Guide. What does it find on top of our library? Horizon Canopy. Okay, well, Painful Lands. At least it's a card drawn. That's that's a gift, if you will, from the Goblin Guide. Iden of Rhetoric isn't terrible, so we're going to go lead an Arbiter. They play a shock land and shock themselves. They searing blood our arbiter. What a what a shock. I wasn't expecting that. They attack us for two. We draw land off, we draw a field of ruin. So we're getting at least we're getting cards off the guy, that's something. I go even Rift Watcher here, so next turn we can double spell by going and give our runes into Idol of Rhetoric. Rift Watcher can block Goblin Guy profitably, gain this life on the way in. If they use a burn spawn, it gains this life on the way out. They can't really ignore it if we end up flickering it. Our opponent searing blaze the Rift Watcher. So, we gain life on the way out, so we're back onto 14. Turns out Idol of Rhetoric would have been immensely better here, but <laughs> what can you do? We've got a Deputy Detention on top of our library, we get hit for 2 going to 9, we draw the Deputy. We play a Giver of Runes, play an Idol of Rhetoric, kill the Rhetoric, they now have to attack the Goblin Guide, and bolt the Idol on. Goblin Guide trigger resolves, showing us a Reflector Mage. I don't really fancy losing my Idol on here, I'm going to take 2 and go to 7. After this, our Giver Runes can protect the Eidolon on these sort of blocks. They spike us down to four. They can no longer cast a spell. However, they can bolt us in our turn. It's a spell per turn. So they have instant speeds like bolts. They can use them in our turn instead. We drew Reflector Mage. 
We play a canopy, we crack the canopy, we draw a vial, we bounce the Reflector Mage. We use Reflector Mage to bounce the Goblin Guide, base Searing Blood, our Giver of Runes. Sure. We go to one, pass the turn, and we die to any burn spell. This has gone pretty badly. Okay, GG. <laughs> We won the die rolls, let's see if we can have a better, more competitive hand. I kept the very slow hand in game one and got punished by burn of all decks. Uh, in round two, we have Aether Vile and a Thalia and a Blade Spice, so we're going to keep this. We're going to leave with Aether Vile, which significantly increases our chance of winning a game of magic. Temporal Deceit from our opponent, making me think this is Ad Nauseam, meaning our Thalia is going to be good, but we also need to apply enough pressure for them not to just, like, well, go around her, essentially. The great thing about Thalia here is that it slows down... Oh, they also suspended a Lotus Bloom, by the way, so they're 100 fucking percent ad nauseum. The great thing about Thalia is that she slows them down, but she allows them to actually tap three lands to make a Pentad Prism with Sunburst 3, which means that later on they can then use the mana from the Pentad Prism as a way to get around Thalia by casting three spells in a turn, namely Angel's Grace, ad nauseum, and Lightning Storm. We drew a Flicker Whist, so we're going to make a Blade Splicer to increase our clock and get in for some... We might be using Flicker Whist to reset our Blade Splicer to widen our board and present more damage, but we might be using it to flicker out our land in an end step in order to stop them going off. We'll see shortly. They suspend a second Lotus Bloom. They cast a two mana Serum Visions. Next turn they have a Bloom, but the Bloom will cost them one mana to, to play. Restor Angel will be our best draw here. We didn't draw Restor Angel. However, we move to combat and attack them. Taking them to 12. We're going to play Hallow Fountain tapped. We're going to activate Aether Vial in our second main phase and make a Flicker Whist that will take out the Blade Splice until end of turn. We're then going to play a Charming Prince. We're going to choose to Flicker out our Flicker Wisp. We go to end step. The Blade Splice comes back and makes a body. The Flicker Wisp comes back and takes out a Temple of Deceit. They untap. They can now pay one mana for their Lotus Bloom, and then they're dead on board. They paid for the Lotus Bloom. This also means if they Angel Grease, they have to crack the Lotus Bloom to do so. They crack the Lotus Bloom and play a Frexian Unlife, which is a shame, because a Flicker Wisp will allow us to take that out and kill them. We want to draw a Wisp here real bad, or a Restoration Angel, or Charming Prince. Nope, that is none of those things. Soul Herder, A. Eh? Okay, we're going to go to combat. Go attack our opponent. They're going to go to minus two. We're going to play a soul herder. We're going to go to end step. We're going to trigger soul herder and flick a flicker wisp. Say yes. And then the wisp is going to target the fraction unlife. They're going to lose the unlife. And at minus two, they're going to lose the game. Soul herder was actually a perfect draw there as well. I didn't factor it in alongside flicker wisp, charming prince, and restoration angel. But it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Now, I wasn't too sure when I was putting Lavinia in, but I wanted to try playing her again, and this is the matchup where she's great. She makes Lotus Blooms worse, she makes Ad Nauseums worse, because they can't cast it unless they have exactly five lands in play. She is great versus their deck. Opening hand has Damping Sphere in it, which is importantly a piece of disruption that doesn't die to random bits of removal from our opponent. They're probably starting in potentially wear tears and such, because they can get our Aether Vials with it, but they'll also have some sort of removal spells, whether that be... Um, Flame Tendrils, Bontu's Last Reckoning, Dismembers, Path to Exiles, that sort of thing. Lotus Bloom is currently in exile, on cooldown as I often refer to it, because it's suspended. Our opponent is ahead of the curve, casting spells for one mana, unlike last game where Arthalia did good work on slowing them down. Because they know what we're there against now, they can keep hands, or at least look for hands that aren't as slow and cumbersome, or at least can cast their cantrips before we cast Arthalia. Temple of Enlightenment from our opponent, Descry 1. We cast a Damping, so stop them from double cantering next turn and similar. They cast a Frexian Unlife. As you can see, we can get around this. Uh, we just need to find the ways to do it. There's a Lotus Bloom coming off the stack next turn, and we've got a Frexian Revoker to turn it off. So that's pretty good. Importantly, Frexian Revoker can stop mana abilities, which you don't get when you use Piping Needle or sort of Spyglass. The reason it has that upside of allowing you to turn off Lotus Blooms and mana dorks like birds of paradise and such it's because it's on a fragile creature body that can die and then this like, it can't actually name land so in legacy there's actually a big tension between the two where piercing needle and social spyglass can name dark depths and thespian stage and well dark depths you don't really name but thespian stage and caracas where Fre frexian revoker can't name those things their lowest moment is the battlefield and now it cannot be activated problem being that we have a very fragile creature in play that could die I'm going to keep my Restoration Angel up to protect my Frexian Revoker from removal here. Next turn I can play a Giver of Runes, then protect it from point of removal. 
uh, whilst keeping Restoration and Angel up and just basically play a little bit conservatively because we have restricted their mana. Dampening Sphere plus the fact they can't crack Lotus Bloom does make their life a little bit. They're going to path to exile my Revoker as we expected and I'm going to Restoration Angel the Revoker. The Revoker will come back immediately thanks to Resto so they'll never get a chance to crack the Lotus Bloom unless they don't have a second path to exile in which case I guess we're fucked. It returns immediately and we're going to rename Lotus Bloom surprisingly. Path to Exile fizzles, although I shouldn't use the term fizzles. Apparently it doesn't exist in the actual rules and it upsets a lot of judges. But I'm going to say it, Path to Exile fizzles, because everyone knows exactly what I fucking mean. Now we want to draw a lean on Arbiter, I think, so we can start messing with our lands with this Ghost Quarter, ideally. But we draw a Lavinia, which is not terrible either. We've got to be careful about playing to Bontu's Last Reckoning as well. But they currently don't have double black, so... As far as uh, Wraths go, we... <laughs> They're going to struggle, right? Like, if they're not playing Bontus, even any of the other alternatives are all double black. Charming Prince. Scry 2. We find Giver Runes and Flicker Wisp. We're going to put Giver Runes on the bottom, put Flicker Wisp on the top of our library. Then we're going to play Giver of Runes for two whole mana. And a Hunt of Eyes and Canopy. And pass the turn. Wisp will allow us to Wisp out the Flexing on Life when we've got them below zero. At this point, I don't think I deploy any more threats. There's a chance I deploy Liz Lavinia, but at the same time, if they have a Wrath when they drop another Black Source, we'll feel very sad about that. No land drop from our opponent. Six cards in hand, though. We get in for seven. This is a two-turn clock. Part of me wonders if Ghost Court in their Dark Slick Shores is the correct thing to do. Uh, a, to test what basics they've got, and B, to minimize a double Black removal spell like Bontu's Last Reckoning. We're in their draw step. Thing is, if we shoot the Dark Slick Shores, I guess they could go Simeon, float the mana, get a basic, tap all the mana, ad nauseum. But it has to be a value ad nauseum because, well, no, they have Frexent on life and play. They could they could get very, very deep into their deck. I don't think it's worth it. Nothing from our opponent. We're going to play a Seacrim Host tapped, move to combat and attack. Now, Angel's Grace to survive. So they'll go to one here. That gives them another turn. Sure. Pass to our opponent. There's their second black source. I wonder if they've got another Angel's Grace in hand. That would be quite frustrating if they did. A field of Ruin, so at least we can mess with their mana. We go to combat attack them. <laughs> Angel's Grace number two. Sure. They go to one again because Angel's Grace stops them from dying. I am then going to blow up their Dark Slick Shores, I think. Yes. The Ghost Quarter. They fail to find, which is alarming, but not surprising, I guess. Oh, they're casting another spell with the mana. Or maybe they're not. <laughs> We're going to play a Soul Herder because we've got the mana to do so. This allows us to reset our Charming Prince as well to Scry 2, perhaps. Our Soul Hunter grows, and we choose the Scry 2. We look at the top two cards of our library. What do we find? We're going to bottom the Arbiter and top the Damping Sphere. Draw step. Blow up their Temple of Deceit. We're going to float a Black Manor. Our Scry just got just shuffled away. Um, I'm an idiot. Oh, well. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. I mean, like, strip mining our opponent is probably better than drawing a second Damping Sphere when they're on one. And they're a combo deck that kill you. They have a one turn kill. For those of you joining us from other card games. An OTK. As they call it in Hearthstone. Trying to sound a bit like wrestling. They fail to get a land. They float some mana and it, go it goes away. They've now got three lands. They're going to cast a Serum Visions. Their next spell costs an additional one thanks to Damping Sphere. They're on one life. They do get to Frex and Unlife to survive. But then we can flick a Whisper out. Even like a Path to Exile Oldest member. Well. They can't cast this member. But a path to Exo on the, on the Revoker would be pretty bad. We have River 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 of Runes? Giver of Runes to protect it. I don't know why I turned into, like, uh, Scooby there. Oh, Scrappy! River of Runes! Anyway, Giver of Runes can protect the Revoker from Path to Exile, and they then wouldn't be able to cast Extra. I guess they could untap and go, like, Angel's Grace into Ad Nauseam. I say untap. Do it in our turn? No. They still couldn't. Yeah, okay. No, no, no. No removal wins them the game here. We get in for a whole bunch... They go to minus eight, and then we've got the choices here of Deputy or Wisp, but I'm going to Wisp for old times' sake, because, you know, I do love me a good Wisp. Also, if somehow this went horribly wrong and they still survived, because they flashed in a Frexion on Life, we get to uh, Soul Herd of the Wisp. Flash in a Frexion on Life. What the fuck am I talking about?
We play Seeker and Coast, we play Aether of Iowa and we pass the turn. Our opponent leads with Mishra's Bauble. They look at the top card there, Lloyd, but they weren't happy with it, so they decided to play a Verdant Catacombs and crack it. They shock themselves. They cast Inquisition of Cossack. Will they hit the Path to Exile or the Thalia here? They took the Thalia. Mishra's Bauble number two. This time looking at our library. They draw some cards of their baubles and we take up our vial to one. Let's see if we draw something useful here or whether we get fucked. Okay, that's legitimately useful. I like it. They cycle Street Wraith. If you haven't figured it out by now, they're 100% some form of Death Shadow. Uh, Mishra's baubles with Jun Colored Lands or Grixis Colored Lands. And then a Street Wraith. Yeah, it's definitely, almost, almost definitely some form of Death Shadow. They Thought Sees Us. They took our Giver of Runes. Because I didn't activate my Aether Vial. Because I was looking at Twitter. Which I haven't done for this entire league until that one moment where it might have mattered. But that said, we get to keep the other cards. So as long as we draw lands, that wasn't a fucking mistake. That's definitely, definitely something. I won't let them thought seize this one. This one's too valuable. Although, that said, a giver of runes against the... Uh, I don't know what the fuck this is actually. This might be four colour? Four colour? Death Shadow? God, a greedy mana base. I wish I was playing red, white with blood moon effects. But yeah, the Giver of Runes is pretty good against their removal. So perhaps I should have prioritised the Giver of Runes of the Vesto Path or Fire and Ice. But uh, we'll see. We'll see. Our opponent needs the Polluted Delta this turn. They crack said Delta. Overgrown Tomb. Traverse the Oven of Wild. Death Shadow to hand. They cast a Death Shadow. Now, I feel like they're going to step and deny me here. Because they know about the Path to Exile, thanks for all the looking at my hand and taking shit out of it. Either way, let's make a Charming Prince. Scry 2. We're looking for lands here. Another path is nice. We're going to put that on top underneath. We're then going to attempt to path this Death Shadow, which I assume will get stubborn and up. Okay. So we've got a path on the way. In the meantime, we can make a 1-1 one -one off the street away from their graveyard uh, to do some chumping. And we'll get our Vile up to 4 soon enough. I think I'm going to play sort of Fire and Ice here. So the following turn we can actually Vile in the Restoration Angel and equip the Sword, which presents a real serious threat because it's like uh, 7 damage to them and they're on 8. And a short of time of Battle Rage, I don't think we die here. So I'm going to say no blocks. Second Death Shadow. Sure, 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 sure. A Tarmogoyf. Sure, 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 sure. We're going to tick up our Vile. We do Path to Exile. So this turn we can equip... To sword to here, which doesn't do anything. We can path one of their threats. We can restoration the charming prince after blocks to gain three life, and then hit them in the air with the with the fire and ice. I believe is what our game plan is. We path them now, or they're tapped out, and they find a basic swamp. And we aren't going to attack because that will tilt our hand, as it were. Now a K command on our sword would be absolutely terrible. But I feel like they might fire that off already if they had it. We're going to activate our Aether Vial here. We're going to attempt to rest over this Charming Prince. Worked. We're now going to pad out our life total, I think. Let's pad out our life total so we can get these swings in. We go to 18. Go back down to 13. They play a second Tarmogoyf. We don't flick up our Vial, obviously. Another path would be ideal. A Stoneforge Mystic is a magic card for sure. We're going to get in in the red zone here with the Restoration Angel carrying a Fire and Ice. If they have Abrupt Decay, if they have a, a Trophy, then we'd feel very sad about life. We're going to attack them. They're still just open to just dying if they have a removal spell, but... we got to kill them somehow. We drew a Wisp. Kind of wish our Vile was on three now. We pass to them. If they can kill our Charming Prince, we die. If they can't, then we can block the 12-12 and take 10. Once upon a time. This thins their deck out, I guess. Nurturing Peatland, that gives them another draw. Oof. Our fate is completely in their hands and the hands of fate. So they crack the Peatland? Yep, they're looking for a removal spell. A bolt, a push, a K command, any of those things will do it. Dismember, they cannot... Well, they can. They can cast it. they got three mana. This is true 5p territory. I'm very tense right now. They spent some time thinking about it. Felt like a slow roll, but they got there. Okay, so that was unfortunate. I felt like we were very, very close. We're going to bring in Deputy of Acquittals and Kitchen Finks. Um, probably a Gideon. Winds of Abandon. 
Maybe the reflector mages as well. We're going to trim three Thalia's at Prince. A Vial and a Stoneforge Mystic on the play. On the draw, it'd be different. Oh, but it's just a lot better when we're on the play. Two lands. Three lands, sorry. Stoneforge and Flicker Webs and two paths. Yeah, this seems pretty good. We're probably going to get Thought Season and lose our Stoneforge Mystic and feel miserable, but that's just magic. They crack a bauble after using two street rates, find a nurturing peatland, and then don't thought seize us, which is nice. It might mean they have push in hand, which makes my stoneforge only mildly better, but at least it can trips this way, and we just get it ripped from our hand. We drew an arbiter. We're gonna play stoneforge first, so we can go get the later equipment. Arbiter might be better there. Maybe I'm being lured down the garden path, as it were, by a stoneforge fucking mystic. But here we are. I got fire nice because if stoneforge dies, it's actually an equipment we can still use. They floated a black mana just to ping themselves, went down to 15. And they play a Jeth Shadow. Interesting. With only one mana up, I'm pretty sure I just Arbiter and then path this. Yeah, that's definitely what I do here. We path the Death Shadow. They push our Arbiter. No, they do not. Yes, they do. They dismember our Arbiter. Death Shadow goes away. They're now on seven. They get another land. And I'm sure there's another Death Shadow in our future. We'll attack them for one. Why not, right? What's the worst that can happen reducing their life total? I guess reducing it to six means that Flicker West carrying a sword is lethal. So six is a whole world of difference away from a seven. Thought sees us. Okay, this does protect the Death Shadow from a path to exile. Thought sees takes our path to exile and they traverse the Ulvenwald. Am I right to use a German accent to pronounce that? It, it sounds like it should be pronounced with a German accent. They make it on 11 11, because, you know, yeah, I guess. We drew a path to exile. Well, you know, I guess we may not need a sword in the end. I'm going to play a Flicker Wisp. And I'm going to Wisp my Seacrum Coast. End of turn, the coast comes back. And I'm going to Path the Death Shadow. This gives us half lethal on a Stoneforge. Lethal on a Flicker Wisp. Also, the Nurturing Peatlands aren't too good when they're on two life. They can only use one of them once. And that makes Stoneforge Mystic Lethal, which makes this a valid removal spell for a singular blocker. So even a Tarmogoyf here looks pretty bad for them, honestly. Collective Brutality here. They're also gaining life, which is always a, a fun thing to see from the Death Shadow player. We can actually, if we draw a land, we can Wisp a land to untap it and also play. Nope, we drew another body, though. That's pretty good. I like that. I'm going to go to combat and attack them. Taking them to two. Again, making it so they cannot use both Nurturing Peatland. Okay, they're happy to go to sideboarding now. Interestingly, we could have bring Lavinia into this because she stops them from cast. It counters Mishra's baubles, and they can't cast dismembers when they're below three lands. So maybe I should bring Lavinia in in this matchup. I'm unsure. Tell me in the comment section below whether you think Lavinia would be worth it against Death Shadow. Okay, we got a two lander. Oh my god! If we draw a third land, this hand's pretty good, right? Right? Anyone? No? Am I an idiot? Oh, come on, we're on the draw. We're on the draw. We got this. We got this. And this, I'm going to complain at the end of this video that I didn't go 3-2. I went 2-3. And this is going to be the reason, right? They Mishra's Bauble. They crack Mishra's Bauble. Because they weren't going to do fuck all else with it. They would have sit it there and activate their now banned Mox Opals, are they, Vince? Jesus Christ. Verdant Catacombs. Overgrown Tomb tapped. No, untapped. Incoming thought sees. See how bad our hand is. No, Mistress Bauble number two. Crack the bauble. Because that's that's what you do. Thought sees. Okay, cool. They go to 15 life. They get to take our path to exile and leave us with three, four, three drops in two lands. And they gotta pray we don't hit a land drop, right? Because then we don't get to play any magic. They actually took the Deputy of Detention, which is interesting. I guess they can't kill it with K-Command. Huh. We do the third land, so we're, 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 we're halfway there, as Bon Jovi would say. Whether or not we're living on a prayer, I'll leave up to the comment section to decide. They street wraith twice down to 11. Six cards in hand. 
God, these decks are so fucking consistent. It makes people shout some lightning bolts in my sideboard to really surprise them out of red-white taxes. That would be... That'd be pretty funny. They traverse the Ovenwald here with four card types in the graveyard, so they can go and get themselves either the land they need to cast the Death Shadow or the Death Shadow. Nurturing Peatland. Death Shadow. I'm gonna use my mana efficiently here and just path it. So if we draw a two drop we can we can play it. We also don't want to path them when they've got blue mana up as we saw it goes badly. We drew a Soul Herder, which is not terrible, but it's not quite where we want to be. I guess a Reflector Mage next turn is going to be pretty gassed if they play Death Shadow. If they play two Death Shadows, then we can Deputy them. But if they play two Death Shadows and keep up a push, then they can just push the Deputy on the end step, and that doesn't feel so hot. Death Shadow number two. Nurturing Peatland number two. Cracking a peatland. And uh, nothing else from our opponent. We're just going to reflect and mage that death shadow then to buy us some time. And then if we draw a fourth land next turn, we can deploy a threat and do some pathing. Reflect a mage. Boo! Bouncy bounce. Okay, do they kill my Reflector Mage? They know we've got the Deputy Detention, so they can't really use a removal spell on the Reflector Mage. If we draw another land, we have Soul Herder into Reflector Mage, bounce into Path to Exile. Although we get Inquisitioned here. But all of our cards in hand are pretty good. I guess it's between, in, I'd say it's between the Soul Herder and the Path to Exile, because one is just a direct answer to the threat, while the other one is a recurring value engine and tempo engine. They took the Deputy of Detention, interestingly. Polluted Delta, meaning they have access to Blue Mana, which means that they have access to Stubborn Denial now. They crack their Polluted Delta. To the surprise of no one... Uh, that hasn't happened yet, but I'm going to say to the surprise of no one, they shock themselves. Huh? Huh? No, <laughs> no, bastards. Okay, I was wrong. <laughs> I was wrong. It looks like they don't want to play their Death Shadow out now. Oh, they can't, because I reflect imaged it, obviously. Uh, we drew Stoneforge Mystic. I'm going to go to combat and attack them for two. Then I guess we play Soul Herder, but then if they have two removal spells, we feel bad. So maybe we play Stoneforge Mystic instead. Go and get a Batter Skull. And now we have Path to Exile up as well. They play a Polluted Delta. They play the Death Shadow we know they've got. They play a Plague Engineer. So they can name Spirit or Elemental here. They name Spirit. Okay. We're going to attempt to path the Plague Engineer. If they have some Denial, it doesn't matter anyway. Okay. No, they didn't have some Denial. Looks like we win! Well, we've won the die roll for the fourth time in a row. Although the, our score doesn't reflect that. We have a hand with Aether Vile and Athalia, so this is pretty good. We're going to keep it. We won the die roll again, so that's nice. Let's keep a hand that's good. Uh, yeah, sure. If they're a deck where we don't think this Ghost Court is going to do a whole lot, we can go Stoneforge first. If not, we can Stoneforge much later. We have Flicker Wisp and Blade Spice to progress the board. However... Flick Wisp is uncastable with our current configuration because we only have one white source. It's also a painful white source. So if they're like burn or some shit, we won't be very happy. I'm going to lead with Ghost Quarter in case we draw a non-painful white source next time. 
and that way we can minimize the damage if we do draw a non-painful white source for our Stoneforge or our Lean and Arbiter. If our opponent goes tap land, we probably play Arbiter to try and mess with their fetches. If they go untapped land, we probably need Stoneforge just to get some value. They're tapping out for Thought Scour or Opt? Ventures Deep, Target Play. Okay, they're, they're milling themselves. They are the Hedron Crab, Fetchy Fetchy, Mill Ourselves deck, so our Arbiter is very, very good against them. We are going to be playing Arbiter next turn. Hopefully that messes up their fetches. You you hold your fetches in this deck before... Sorry, after you play a crab. So being able to actually uh, get them now with this. Hopefully they just play a fetch line next turn and struggle. They could also have push. So they could push the Arbiter in this, and then crack the fetch. But on the upside, it slows them down because they can't get a crab fetch and mill themselves loads. Their game plan is to Grave Cooler, Vodalkin... Oh, Vodalkin. Grave Cooler and Bloodgast us. So we're going to bring us your Hedron Crab now. They hit Creeping Chill, which is going to shoot us. They are a Revenge Vine deck as a part of the thing. They are Crab Vine, I think is the term that has been adopted to describe this. So playing multiple one-drops in a turn. Yeah, they're going to get their Revenge Vine back. That is incredibly frustrating. Our Blade Splicer pairs up well against it, in all fairness. But uh, yeah, the, the turn two Revenge Vine is still a Revenge Vine at the end of the day. So I want to go score them off a land, but I think we have to deploy Blade Splicer first. And then next turn, perhaps, we can go Path to Exile something, plus go score them and see where that leads us. Hedron Crab Mill from the Overgrown Tomb. They also shocked themselves for it as well. They did not hit any Grave Crawlers, any Venge Vines, or any Blood Ghasts. I guess it's overwhelming urge to combine those like creature names into one because of the deck names. Like, I don't know, Venge Ghast or Blood Vine and Grave Vine and all that crap. Like we've got Crab Vine, which is actually a very cool Portman. Portman 2? Is it a Portman 2? That's a Portman 2, right? Crab Vine. Memory Sluice, they're going to conspire and mill themselves some more. Sure, 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 sure. They hit another Creeping Chill. They hit a Prized Amalgam and a Gravecrawler. And they have a Zombie in play. So they can now cast Gravecrawler, which will bring back Prized Amalgam. They cast Murfolk Secret Keeper instead, which chills us. Out of the graveyard to get us to five. They can now play the Gravecrawler, reanimating the Venge Vine. No, they haven't played another one drop this turn, so they can't get the Venge Vine this turn. We're on five, by the way. And they still have one more Creeping Chill in their deck. Two Amalgams in the bin. Doesn't feel good. We need to draw another White Source so that we can activate... Uh, or cast Flickerwish, should I say, to widen our board state to not just die to an onslaught of Amalgams next. We just drew another Wisp instead, which is really frustrating because we kind of need... We can't even Ghost Quart ourselves for another White Source because of our Arbiter in play. We could swing at them with the Arbiter and see if they block. But it, it's kind of obvious why we'd be swinging. It'd also leave us dead if they don't block. I think at this stage it might be our only option, but even then we'll have... One, two, three, four blockers if things go our way. And they're attacking with one, two, three, four, five creatures. Let's see if they take the bait. This is so obviously telegraphed. They're just going to take it and go 23. They're 25 life thanks to the buff of Creeping Chill. Okay, that was not good for us. Yeah, no, this is over. They, they could, like, not attack correctly, but I'm, I'm not much in the business of hoping for that sometimes, you know. Okay, our hand has Rift Watcher and Soul Herder and Restoration Angel, so it's not terrible. Our path can also deal with a Hedron Crab or a recurring threat like a Vengevine, so yeah, I think, I think we can keep this. It's slow, but once it's online, we'll be getting a lot of life and making decent threats. I guess our best second turn draw would be a Stoneforge Mystic or an Arbiter, though I'll just take any two drops, so I'd take a Thalia as well. Tap land from our opponent is nice. Arbiter off the top would be absolutely great. No, we didn't. Okay, that's fine. We can keep up a path here, though, for when they play a crab. Although they didn't get a blue source. I'm wondering what the green-black source on turn one indicates. I'm unsure. If you know in the comment section below what that means in terms of their hand for the crab vine deck, please let me know. They shot themselves here. Did they play loam? I don't think they play loam. Glimpse the Unthinkable. Wow, I didn't even know they played that either. They glimpse hitting a Narc Amoeba and a Creeping Chill. The Narc Amoeba is going to bring back a prized Amalgam, which kind of sucks for us, but there you have it. Amalgam comes back. We untap. We get to play... 
Even Rift Watcher gains us two life and blocks the Narcomy, but we're going to lead up with Soul Herd next turn anyway. But Blade Spell also makes a body that blocks a 3-3, three, three, so it gets us the same amount of distance, whilst also allowing us to deploy Flutter Mage before Soul Herder if next turn looks brutal. Also, Golem is pretty good at blocking a Venge Void if they make one, and there is one in the graveyard at present. Plus two Grave Crawlers. If they go land, Stitch Supplier, Grave Crawler, Grave Crawler, there's a lot of power on board. Ideally, we're looking to draw a fourth land next turn so that we can play Soul Hooder and keep our path to exile, and then the following turn, Restoration Angel or something, and just get into this game really hard. They play in Shock and Overgrown Tomb into play. They're tapping Green Black there, but decided not to. If they got Assassin's Trophy, I really want them to fire off now on our Blade Splicer, not later on on our Soul Hooder, because our Soul Hooder is the engine of making our hand kind of pop. They're going to push our Golem, which is fine. Does mean we're taking a hell of a lot of damage this turn, though. Oh, no, they can't bring back the Vengevine this turn. So we're just going to take four. That's fine. Nothing post-combat. I'm assuming they've got a trophy as well. We drew a Ghost Quarter, which is good. So we can go Soul Herder. They're reading it, because it's not commonly played. Outside of Gabriel and Soul Herder deck, which is also sweet. So it has seen some modern play, but not huge amounts. We're going to go to combat and attack them. They're going to decay our Soul Herder. We sort of saw this coming, let's be real, because we, we were aware they had a green-black spell because they signaled it so badly. It is frustrating because it puts us in a real, real tight spot. Um, we might actually lose the game because Soul Herder is such a fragile engine. Uh, it's frustrating that the Crab Vine deck is actually playing so much fucking removal. But uh, we'll see. Maybe we can come back from this. Bloodstained Mire cracked from our opponent. They don't shock themselves. Instead, they they, they, they push our Blade Spices. That's three bits removed from the Crab deck. Why didn't they replay the Grave Crawlers last turn because they had a zombie? That was, oh, the zombie was at the end of turn? No, wait. I'm confused. I think they punted last turn. Oh no, they were keeping up the trophy, of course. Or in this case, that's an abrupt case. So we're going to take a whopping... Well, we're going to path the Vengevine. Good nine. We untap. We draw an Arbiter, which is just too damn late. We're going to reflect a mage the Amalgam here to minimise damage. Next turn we can Rift Watcher if we're still alive. And then from the Rift Watcher, we can then Restoration Angel, the Rift, Rift Watcher, all the Reflector Mage, and just try and claw our way back into this game. Okay, they hard cast Avengerine, which is less than ideal, shall we say. And they move to combat. We're going to take an absolute beating here. Seven damage total. Uh, okay. Drawing a path would be nice for the Avengerine. So we can go Raven Wolf Watcher plus path. Now we draw another land, so we can go Rift Watcher plus Arbiter. That does allow us to survive a turn. Our opponent plays a land. And then moves to combat. They only attack with a Narc Amoeba, so we're going to block with the Rift Watcher. This is to enable push, perhaps? I'm unsure. Maybe they didn't realise the Rift Watcher could fly. It is kind of a weird card. They have an amalgam in hand they can cast though, so so swing with the grave crawlers plus the vengevine doesn't doesn't stop them from recasting the grave crawlers. And if we could have brought the vengevine, they could have recast the grave crawlers and brought the vengevine back. So I'm not quite sure what that attack was about. I guess we're about to find out when they cast a five mana haymaker, like I don't know the scarab god or some nonsense. They play the amalgam, get to untap. Vanishing on our Avon Rift Watcher. We drew a Charming Prince, which isn't terrible, honestly. We can choose to either get him for two here, and then Reflector Mage the Vengevine in combat. Yeah, I think we do that. Because we need to kill them eventually. They go to 13, and we pass to them. They've got mana up, so I'm assuming an abrupt decay or assassin's trophy, the fourth bit of removal out of the crab vine deck. I guess if they didn't have so much removal interaction, they probably would have just murdered us dead with a really fast clock. Maybe we should have, like, only kept a hand with rip in it. But that doesn't feel like the kind of magic that I want to play where I'm forced to mulligan to that sort of thing. Though I guess some of you might say perhaps I shouldn't play modern if that were the case. They untap. 
They went to cast a one mana black spell there and decided not to, so they're either bluffing or they have a push. They attack. I'm going to flash in a Restoration Angel here. The question is, do I flicker the Avon Watch to give us another blocker, or the Reflector Mage? Ideally, I want to kill the Amalgam and both the Gravecrawlers, just to keep the Zombie Horde down. At the same time, whilst doing that, I think the Restoration Angel needs to survive the fight, although it might get pushed, because then we can swing back in the air for a load of damage next turn. I'm going to flicker the Rift Watcher to get the most life out of it. We gain four life when it leaves and enters again. You get two life each time it enters and leaves. So one flicker is four life. Now they can push the Arbiter, but at the moment, without Revolt enabled, Fatal Push doesn't kill anything else on the board. Post-combat, of course, it will. Maybe they have an Assassin's Trophy here instead? Or just another abrupt. If they kill our Rift Watcher here, we'll gain two life. We gain two life here, and we get to go and get a land. No, we don't, because there's an Arbiter in play. Bum, 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 bum. We're on six, so we're dead to a Creeping Chill, but I think we want to kill off everything on this board. And then we can reset our Reflector Mage next turn. We got a two. Stitch a Supplier, which allows them to replay the Grave Crawlers. They hit... No, they didn't hit Creeping Chill. If they hit Creeping Chill, we just died. <laughs> grave Crawler number one brings back the Amalgam. We're just fighting the, like inevitable tide and it's not working we drew a planes which is less than ideal we needed to draw actual magic cards uh but alas here we are with uh six lands in play we have to gain life off of our charming prince so we can't attack with both our creatures we can attack with the restoration angel here then we can reset the restoration angel Reset our Charming Prince. Gain three life. And now we're in a situation where we have to block the Vengevine, the Amalgam, one Gravecrawler, and go to two. They attack us, so we're going to kill off the Vengevine, which feels terrible considering the, the Gravecrawlers. I don't think we have an actual win here. And now they can replay one of the Grave Crawlers, but that won't bring back the Vengevine on the upside. If we kill both the Grave Crawlers, then of course they could bring back the Vengevine easily. They could be chill in hand though, so we're dead. Yeah, we weren't winning that from about the midway point. Okay, we've won the die roll for the fifth time in a row. Guess I'm running hot today. We have the ability to cast the Stoneforge Mystic, but not the Wisp or the Soul Lord or the Restoration Angel. However, we'll draw another land. Like, that's just how magic works, right? It'll be fine. It'll be fine. A ghost quad is good against Tron. So we've even got like a card against one archetype in the format. Prismatic Vista from our opponent. They crack it. What basic land do they fetch? Place your bets now. Oh, it's a forest. Ape shift or oh, birds of paradise. Is this Ponza? Guess I can grab my Umazawa's Jitte. I'm only joking. You can't. Some people think it should be unbanned. Those people are silly. I'm gonna play the Stoneforge Mystic now. Next turn we're gonna play the Aether Vile and pl plow. We're gonna we're gonna Stoneforge in an equipment. Plow in an equipment? God, I'm too bad. Think about legacy, daydream about legacy. We're gonna get fire and ice or bad score. We're gonna get fire and ice because it can kill mana dorks if they are a dork heavy deck. Let's say they are some sort of Camellira combo, company combo nonsense, then we can kill and ping off dorks with the sort of fire and ice with our flyers. Wooded hit foothills from our opponent. Are we going to have our land blown up? That is the question. That's going to bolt our Stoneforge Mystic, which seems legit. I'll, I'll allow it this time. Goblin Guide. What the fuck? Hex Drinker. What the fuck? That Hex Drinker is going to be a serious problem when it just fucking murders us. Jesus Christ. On a bike. What do we find with the... We found a Leland Arbiton of our library. Well, that's certainly a magic card. Um. Okay. Well. Got to kill him in the air before they kill us on the ground. We go Leon and Arbiter. Aether Vial. They can level it up to a 4 4 this turn. That zoo with birds is interesting. They can't counteract the fetch land without paying for it. And if they do that, they can't level up. If they level up, then they can't pay for the Ghost Quarter next turn. So if we draw a white source, we can flicker our Ghost Quarter with our Flicker Wisp and get them. Okay, they're making it a 4 4. It's got protection from instance. I guess I can just flicker that to be fair. I guess we're taking 6. Go to 12. Tick up our vial, and for the love of God, please draw another land. We did not. Okay, we're going to go Moorland Haunt and Plains to make the Stoneforge Mystic. 
Uh, cannot pay, cannot pay, cannot pay. It's a body. It's a body. It can block. It's all fine. It can block. I literally absentmindedly didn't even think of the fact that... There we go. First time on the channel that they've non-bowed. I talked about it a lot for years when Stoneforge Mystic wasn't legal. And now we've seen it and it pains me to see it. You hate to see it, folks. You hate to see it. We're going to blow up their stomping ground here. This means they can only sink another two, maybe three mana at this turn, so it won't get protection from everything. We want to wisp that bad boy. They crack the fetch and fail. Sweet. Guess we're all making punts into the Arbiter of the Day, my friends. Do they say anything in chat? Well, no, nope, they don't, but I made a face. There's another foothills. Cool, 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 cool. Two counters on it. This turn makes it a five. The following turn makes it a seven. They might pay to crack through it, I guess. They attack with a Goblin Guide and a Hex Drinker. Goblin Guide finds us a land. Not the one we want, but it is another Ghost Quarter effect. We're going to block the Stoneforge Mystic and take four, going to eight. They are going to pay for the Foothills, it seems, this turn. We're going to tick up our Vile. We drew a Blade Splice, which isn't the worst, because it gives us bodies to block all this nonsense flying at us. If they play a land next turn, this is going to be an eight, eight, a 6-6 six, six protection from everything, which means we're really boned. Like, really bone. Attack them with the Arbiter. Let's hope they don't hit a land drop this turn. But there's a good chance they do, let's be real. So, crack the fetch. Get a land. Untap. Oh, hang on. If they get a land drop, they can only make it seven. And then we can wisp it out. This is a good day. I miscounted. They level up. If they have a Sivian Spirit Guide, that would be pretty funny. Because we'd be in trouble. Okay. It's got four counters on it. They're going to attack. They're going to see two mana open in case we feel the room. They're going to keep it back on defense. Interesting. A Vile. Druathalia. We've got Field of Ruin up as well. I'm tempted just to slam the Sword of Fire and Ice into play. And then we can Vile in the Flicker Wisp to flicker out the Hex Drinker. We're going to wait. We're going to let them sink some mana into the Hex Drinker on their turn. And then we're going to Wisp it out. They untap. They play a land, they can sink four mana into making the Hex Drinker a protection from everything, but we can flicker it out on the final one. Grim Lava Mancer on the stack. It's got summoning sickness, thank god, because that's going to rip a hole in our defense. They tap out for a Scoos as well. End of turn, we're going to take away the Hex Drinker for a whole turn cycle. By Viling and Flicker Wisp, trigger, take away the Hex Drinker. We untap. We find no tick up on our vial. Quip this. It's fire and ice to go to combat and attack. Five in the air. We ping and kill the lava mancer. We drew an eighth of vial, which isn't very useful here. We play a thalia. We vial in a soul herder. Go to end of turn. We can allow first on last off. So we're going to choose to flicker our wisp. We can't. Fire gives it protection from blue and white. We're just going to flicker our Blade Spice instead. They get their Hex Drinker back. And they decide that they've seen enough. But that's an interaction I hadn't seen yet. Of course, Soul Hood is blue and this gives protection from blue. Can't flicker it if it's equipped. Our opening hands are one lander with a vial. If they brought in, like, anything like Knight of Autumns or similar to blow up artifacts and they get our vial, we'll feel very silly. But I'm going to risk it for the biscuit. We've got a one drop, we've got a two drop, and we've got a three drop. Um, one of the three drops being very, very good with other creatures that we have in hand. Stoneforge Mystic's a bit shite without... Oh, okay, we're going to have to probably path that before we play a creature. Stoneforge Mystic's a bit shite without a second land, but I'm sure we'll draw at least one more land. There you go, there you go, there you go, there you go. We make an Aether Vial and pass back. Next turn we can path the Grim Lava Monster and make a Giver of Runes done tap, and then make a Stoneforge Mystic we protect with a Giver of Runes and hopefully gain huge amounts of incremental tempo there because they won't be able to kill our things efficiently enough. Our opponent plays a Prismatic Vista. I assume they're going to crack it immediately, holding up fetch lands for their deck. A, doesn't seem to make sense. B, it fuels Grim Lava Monster. And C, they want to avoid getting randomly arbitered down the line. Burning Tree Emissary mean they are really an aggressive zoo deck. Burning Tree into... Are we going to see another Burning Tree or Scoos, perhaps? No, they don't have a two-drop in hand. We get attacked for one. Okay, we untap. We tick up our Vile. We drew a Giver of Runes. Frustratingly, we can't deploy one of those. Mm, frustrating. We're going to flash in our Giver into the end of their turn. And we're going to Plowshares. I say Plowshares. I'm still thinking of Legacy. We're going to path the Grim Lava Mancer after combat. 
We'll pass the, the last opportunity, even though it's tapped. They can obviously fire it off if they don't attack with it. But we're firing off the path of the last possible opportunities to play some horrendous three drop that I haven't like accounted for, you know? Okay, I'm going to save some life here. We super, super, super want to draw another land next turn. So we can play a three drop on curve. And we're going to make a giver runes off of our vial at the end of the turn. They might have a removal spell for her. We've got a second one coming. There is a, like a question of whether we keep our vial on one so we can deploy the other giver of runes alongside this Stoneforge Mystic. But I think getting up to three is too important considering we have both Soul Hood and Reflector Mage in our hands. So we're not going to do that. We do the third land anyway. So that's pretty good. Reflector Maging the Burning Tree actually feels really bad. So instead, I'm going to make a Stoneforge Mystic. We're going to grab a Sword of Fire and Ice. We're then going to go ahead and play a Soul Herder. And then at the end of turn, we can flick a Stoneforge Mystic and grab a Badder Skull. And we've drawn two cards this turn, thanks to the creature we deployed. And we deployed five mana's worth of spells, thanks to the tempo from Aether Vial. And you can soon see how this deck isn't just a pile of complete shite. Next turn, we're going to have the ability to deploy an equipment off of Stoneforge Mystic, make a Reflect Mage off of our Aether Vial. Oh no, I lied. We don't have any white mana. Well, we can actually Reflect a Mage that makes the moon to gain white mana. We're going to untap. We're going to take off our Vial. We're going to activate Vial. Say yes to the activation. Make a Reflect a Mage, which is going to trigger and bounce the Magus of the Moon. We're then going to make a Giver of Runes. And I think we're going to just hold up our Stoneforge and decide whether we want a Banner Skull or Fire and Ice at the end of the turn. We're going to use Soul Herder to flicker Reflector Mage. Reflector Mage will come back. It will trigger. It will bounce the Burning Tree for a turn. They can't play it next turn. So the hand has a, a useless Burning Tree and a useless Magus for a turn in it as well. They play a Foothills. They play like two red blockers that I'm going to obviously Stoneforge the Fire and Ice in. If they don't do that, then I'm going to just play Batskull. Birds of Paradise. And a Clothis. Oh my jeez. Okay, interesting addition to, 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 to the zoo. Indestruct all 4, 5, or 3 mana. As long as your devotion to red or green is 7, it's a creature. Uh, at the beginning of your pre combat main phase, exile target card from a graveyard. If it was a land card, add red or green. Otherwise, you'll gain 2 life and cloth deal 2 damage to each opponent. Interesting. So I'm going to vial in... I say vial in. I'm going to stoneforge in the batter skull here. Because if we draw another land, we can make the Fire Knights off the Stoneforge and equip it to something as well. And then we get the most damage out of this. Because this would be unsummoning sick. We're not going to take up our Vile. We drew another land. We're going to activate Stoneforge Mystic. I feel like we're having our cake and eating it here. Make a Fire Knights. Equip said Fire Knights to the... F no, not to the Reflector Mage. We're going to equip it to the... To this... No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Giver of runes. I'm going to get super aggressive here. Then we attack with everything. Apart from the giver of runes that's not equipped. Here they probably have to block the giver of runes. Carrying the sword of fire and eyes. Which means they take. Uh, what's that? Nine damage. If they don't do that. Okay. The bird's going to die. Okay. Sure. We get to draw a card off our giver of runes as well. Which is pretty absurd. We drew a path to exile. Okay. At end of turn, we're just going to flicker the... I guess the Stoneforge Mystic. Doesn't really matter. You don't want to flick your germ because it will kill it. This is more just a grass soul herder as opposed to anything else. We're going to say no to the Stoneforge Mystic trigger. As we don't have any more equipment in our deck. I almost played a third one. I almost played Light and Shadow or uh, War and Peace. Or perhaps Feast and Famine depending on the metagame. But didn't in the end. They're going to exile the path to exile in our graveyard, gain two life, and shoot us for two. Seems like a solid effect on every single turn. Especially if you can turn it on in like a go-wide strategy like Zoo with burning trees and similar. Our board state does look kind of like magical Christmas land. 
I do acknowledge that this game has gone particularly well for us. An anger of the gods or something could be interesting, but I mean, I can't imagine a. Uh, I say interesting, it only killed part of our board. But I can't imagine Zoo running something like that on its sideboard. Burning Tree in two. Seasoned Pyromancer. That's a lot of blockers. Uh, but Fire and Eyes equipped to the germ carrying the Bat Skull just kills them. They're actually only one. They're one devotion of turning Clothets into a 4 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So a bird of Paradise would have got them online. We drew another Soul Herder, but that's irrelevant. We're just going to kill them. I'm having a lot of fun with this, though, so I kind of want the game to end, but. I'm going to play for the win as opposed to being a tit. That was Blue, White, Death and Taxes. Uh, I feel like we got a bit unlucky with those matches. But to be fair, I'm saying unlucky. I kept a slow hand and was punished by Burn. And then against the Graveyard deck, we didn't have any Graveyard hate in hand for either game. So, yeah, there's evident ways we can improve. So I can't just say we got unlucky. There is clear things we could learn from. I also kept some questionable hands in other games. Just saying YOLO and they worked out. Because Magic is, you know, a game of variance a lot of the time. Uh, this deck seems fun. I don't know if it's better than Green White or Red White. And I haven't played Black White in ages. That might be a video coming in the next week or so. But I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know if there's any changes you would make. Are you really mad keen for Spell Queller and Lavinia, for example? When Spell Queller can fuck right off, in my opinion. Let me know in the comment section below. And I'll see you all very, very soon. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe. And I'll see you all in the next one. Ta-ta for now.